Hey everyone, this is your instructor Matthew Doyle coming with your second part of the first week lectures. So just as a little bit of background, uh, each week I'm going to sort of chunk the videos so they'll be unified by a color theme um, and everything that you have to watch for one week is going to basically look kind of, yeah, same color scheme and then have those numbers you can see up at the upper left corner of the screen. So it'll be lecture 1.1 for the first one of the week, 1.2 for the second one, and 1.3 for the third one. Um, and so each week, yeah, please make sure that you get to watch all those videos. Uh, today, I'm really excited. This is a subject that is really close to my heart. Um, I have a kind of background in literature and in studying history. And so I like to kind of start this course by talking a little bit about what is the history of digital games, as in, let's look at each one of those parts of that sentence. So, what is history, what is a gamer, um, and what is digital, right? So let's get started. Uh, how many of you have seen Stanley Kubrick's film, 2001 A Space Odyssey? If you've seen it, uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. It's a little long, it's about three hours long. It's one of my favorite films, and uh, I think when it came out in 1968 or so, it was really considered like a monument. It really launched an entire science fiction genre. Um, you know, I think movies like Interstellar, for example, are movies that are influenced by 2001 A Space Odyssey. But uh, one of the things that Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey is infamous for is that the first 15 minutes are a basically non-verbal portrayal of the dawn of man. So Kubrick is starting his film about the future by showing us a prehistoric world that is devoid of humans as we understand them. We see a group of bipedal apes roaming a desert landscape. They tire, they fall asleep, and then when they awaken, they're confronted with a mysterious black obelisk. They shriek and shout and jump around the obelisk, which somehow remains impervious to their efforts to disturb it. And the next day, after having this encounter with the obelisk, one of the apes picks up a bone and realizes that he can use it as a tool. And this encounter Kubrick uses to show sort of the moment where maybe, you know, we had an evolutionary jump from being apes to being homo sapiens, right? To being humans the tool user, man, the knower, homo sapiens. And uh, to, to further drive this point home uh, is one of the most famous match cuts in all of cinematic history. An ape tosses a bone in the air and then we cut four million years later to a satellite falling in space. So I bring this up when I'm asking this question, what is history, right? Why? Um, well, what is this black obelisk that the apes encounter that somehow gives them the knowledge to pick up this bone and make that leap forward? What is it that moves history forward? You know, is it something from beyond our understanding, right? And I think that in some ways that obelisk is like a placeholder for this mysterious force of what pushes history and especially technological progress forward. I bring this up because we are going to be having a course on the history of digital games, which is by extension a history of computers. And you have to admit, it's pretty amazing how some of the ways that we normally think about history and time scales are challenged by the very, very short time scale that computers and digital technology have existed on this earth. So if you look at this picture, right, this is geological time from the Archaean to the Proterozoic to the Cambrian, the Ordovician. There's, a, this is for more the people at Caltech down the road from us, but geological time goes back 4.6 billion years to the core of the earth and the subsequent strata that we can study as we move down through it, right? So this is geological time. This isn't even history because it's 4.6 billion years ago. This is before written language. This is before the appearance of humans. So it is prehistoric. That's why we use the term prehistoric. 
If we look and ask ourselves, when does history begin? You can see I've drawn a line to indicate that it's basically in the Holocene era, um, which is a very, very small portion of all of geological non-human time. And within that, there is even a, another division between prehistory understood as the 10,000 years BC or before the common era, uh, and then from basically, you know, AD, that's the beginning of history, history. If you break it down even further and ask yourselves, okay, so the invention of the computer, uh, the personal computer, the Apple computer took place in the 1970s in the United States, um, the American Republic. So if we look back to the beginning of the founding of America as a republic through the Revolutionary War in 1776, which remember is still even before the Industrial Revolution takes place in Britain, you can see I cut another line. It's another even smaller slice of that tiny slice of geological time. And then if we look in more detail at the history of the Americas in the last 300 or so years, the history of digital games is 78 of those years. So it occupies basically the time from post-World War II, 1952, we'll get into more detail about that, through the Summer of Love, the Vietnam War, and all the way up until the present day. So the history of digital computers and digital games is really a very recent history. It is 78 or so years old, as we understand it in sort of popular culture. In that short period, digital games have evolved from the purview of a small group of university engineering students working with bulky mainframe computers to a mass media entertainment form with undeniable influence and cultural impact. Was off the rim, he had a back post. Had to hit my old town to duck the nose. Two for a while, I locked down. So, for those of you who haven't seen that video before, to me, this is really like a true, um, how would I say, it's a convergence moment between popular culture, hip hop, music, and gamer culture. This was a live concert that was created by the hip hop artist Travis Scott and set in the game world of Fortnite. Fortnite, if you haven't heard of it, is one of the most popular games among Gen Z gamers. It's popular also across all demographics. It is immensely profitable as well. The game generated $5.8 billion in revenue in 2021, surpassing its previous annual record of $5.4 billion in 2018. Did you know that the market for digital games was valued at over 300 billion and rising in 2023? For comparison, the global film and entertainment market is valued at 100 billion. So remember, you live in Los Angeles, you're living at the epicenter of the entertainment industries in America, and certainly where you have many digital games companies headquartered, with having global outposts and headquarters, Blizzard uh, in Anaheim and Riot Games. Um, if you're interested in working in the games industry, as I believe many of you are, the size of the market and where you are right now should make you extremely motivated and very excited to find a job in the field if that is what you desire to pursue. But I do want to use this as a little bit of a red herring. Uh, if digital games were only an economy, we would be only customers. We would not be, shall we say, uh, players, gamers, people who care about the history, the context, who are fans of these games and these franchises, right? If you just look at it in terms of dollars and cents, if you look at games simply as products, then we are only customers. That's to say, think about all of the things that you associate with games. Friendships, family, storytelling, imagination. Games and play are inherently social activities, and this predates digital games, which we'll talk about in one of our later lectures about early theories of play. So 
I believe that they are constituent components of society. They predate culture. They are not simply economic goods traded in a marketplace. And I wanna bring that up because I think that that's a danger that we can flirt with when we teach the history of digital games. I've certainly learned it over the three years I've developed this course. Games are so tied up with consumer capitalism that it can often seem like you are just telling a history of businesses. Atari, Apple, Intel, all these businesses that were you know, developing these technologies. And to me, that would be the economic or business history. Um, but let's live in a society, not in an economy. This is a course that focuses on a cultural history of games. And specifically, what I wanna talk about today is what is the relationship between culture, society, and history? And perhaps most importantly, also, how does that relate to you as a gamer or a student living in the year 2023? So I found this really nice diagram online. Um, as you can see, there is a green circle that's encircling a smaller purple circle that's named the culture circle. The green circle is called the environment circle. So you can see it goes from the environment to culture in purple, and then persons and society. So we can break this down a little bit. And of course, at the bottom of the screenshot, you also see time, which goes left and right. And I'm gonna call that sort of history, especially if we're talking about digital games. Um, we're talking about a specific historical period of about 70 years. But if we break this down right, we say that time is something that kind of is perhaps the most abstract category in this diagram. It's something that's sort of encircling everything. And then you have the environment. So that could be, let's call it the sum total of all human and non-human actors and objects. So everything, whether it's animals, a can of Coca-Cola, uh, the McDonald's that's down your street, uh, a car, these are things that now, they, that we exist in an environment where these things can affect us, right? If I walk out the door and I don't pay attention, I could be hit by a car because that's part of my environment. So I say that specifically because I wanna make sure that we emphasize that the environment is not just a natural thing. An environment encompasses human, non-human, artificial, and natural phenomenon. It's anything that can be affected or does affecting on other things. But within that, we have these more specifically human things. So that's culture, society, individuals. Culture is the shared beliefs, values, customs, traditions, and behaviors that characterize a group or a society. And a society is really simply a group of people who share a common territory, interact with one another, and are thus bound by social relationships and perhaps even institutions that shape those relationships. So to use a very sort of simple example, we at PCC exist in a society. We are, our, our relations are governed by an institution and that exists within the broader, diverse, multicultural background of Los Angeles. So you can be coming from your own specific cultural background. I'm coming from my own cultural background. We're also within the culture of Los Angeles and we are socially connected within that institution of PCC. And remember, within that group, we all get to have our own goals, objectives, and agency. So that's the role of the individual within the society. So that's to say, you are here. You are a person living in a society, within a culture, which is interacting with an environment of non-human and human actors within the sea of time. <laughs> Pretty awesome. And I want to talk now about that specifically, about you, because I believe when I've been teaching this course, that the most important thing I've realized is that because the history of digital games overlaps with our personal life histories, that you and I are important parts of the story of digital games. We have a unique perspective. We are in that historical moment. So I think it's fair to say that the chances are, if you're watching this video, that you're a gamer. Well, I wonder, right? 
what is a gamer? We all probably can think of some negative stereotypes that exist about gamers. Perhaps, let's say, not too long ago, this was maybe correlated with the stereotype of the nerd. Uh, exclusively male, loners, eating junk food, horribly messy desk. But it's interesting, I wanna talk for a moment about what that word stereotype means, right? How many of you actually know the origin of this word? I think we generally think of it as like, you know, negative stereotype. Well, stereotype is actually just a technical term that's borrowed from the era of the printing press, so the invention of mass media. A stereotype, a stereo plate, or simply sometimes called a stereo, is a solid plate of type metal cast from paper mache or plaster that takes the form of a surface of type. Um, in early letterpress printing, typefaces were cast letter by letter. So when you had to print something like a newsletter or a pamphlet, um, you had this incredible mass production ability, but you did first have to set all those individual letters into uh, letter type. Um, so a stereotype is simply when, if a word was being repeated over and over again. So for example, if you were starting a newspaper that covered Los Angeles, well, you might have the word Los Angeles appear a lot in the newspaper. So you're gonna cast a stereotype that says Los Angeles. Maybe you'll even get a couple of them and put them where they need to go in your story. This is a full stereotype plate. And so we remember that in that first definition slide, we saw that stereotype also means fixed and unchanging. And I bring this up because I think that if games and movies and television, blogs, the internet are all mass media formats that we interact with on a daily basis, they are the water through which we swim, uh, that the newspaper and the printing press were these important organs of the dissemination of information. It's sort of the origin, really, of this ability to disseminate information amongst the people in a society. And I think that they are great artifacts to look at if you are a cultural historian, as we are in this class, because they always bring with them the cultural values and beliefs of the time, the stereotypes, we may say. So appropriately, if we look to newspapers, we can see some of these negative stereotypes about gamers, maybe where they would come from. So this uh, news article says, ban these evil games, and it has Doom 3, Grand Theft Auto, Manhunt, a bunch of ultra-violent games, actually, I think a disproportionate representation from Rockstar Games. Um, but you know, I mean, so reasonably speaking, in the mass media, this could help to create a stereotype that games are, at the very least, antisocial, right? Um, that element of interaction, I think, where you play as a character that commits violence is something that mainstream culture still hasn't fully wrapped its head around yet. So there's always gonna be this thing where they say, oh, well, there's violence in a game, violence in real world, how can we tie a connection between those two things? And going back even further um, to the uh, Malaysian video game ban, which we'll be covering a little bit later when we talk about violence in digital games, you know, you see this great uh, cartoon where Pac-Man is leading these children like he's the, uh, He's the Pied Piper. Uh, he's leading everybody astray. And I think that this relates to another stereotype about games, which is that they're unproductive. They lead you astray into a world of illusions. But one thing is for sure, in 2023, a lot of these conversations about the harm of video games, and I would even say that some of the negative stereotypes about games have disappeared, replaced now by this as sort of the generic image of the gamer. So that's a young woman or man sitting at a brightly lit up LED desktop with a, with a cooled, a fan-cooled PC next to them, streaming and talking to their friends. So it's a far cry, it's a much more generic, is an emergence of a sort of generic type here, right? A new stereotype. And also, I think you see this happening through mainstream culture, through celebrities. I think these articles are kind of ridiculous sometimes, but it is funny, it's tabloid fodder, right? Celebrities who love video games. Mila Kunis, Zac Efron, if you Google this, I'm sure you'll even be able to find another updated article from 2023, which is a new batch of celebrities who have suddenly converted to being hardcore gamers. Um, 
Another aspect that's changed stereotypes about gamers is the rise of competitive esports as big business. Sponsorships, whether they're by uh, game companies or electronics companies, um, there are now more money associated with competitive esports. So you could get a sponsorship and a large following on, uh, online, and these are often huge events with large crowds. And connected to this as well, or perhaps maybe the uh, the next generation after competitive esports, which do seem like they're a little bit on the decline now, is streaming. Uh, gaming has become a huge part of a social media landscape that's emerging with the rise of platforms like Twitch TV, which kind of have, to, have they've, they've created their own stars, but now often you will see social media personalities just add, you know, they might be big on TikTok and then they add Twitch streaming to be part of that repertoire. Um, and they start playing games because that's a demographic that they can look at and appeal to. Um, another thing that's shifted some of the stereotypes around gaming is that some people, maybe more in academia, uh, art history, and the humanities, will make the case that games are valuable because they're serious forms of art, right? Um, which is something that is a debatable topic. I think that the question of the difference between a mass media product and the work of an individual gamer or indie game developer is a subject that, you know, that's a really interesting topic we'll cover later in the course. Um, and something that I uh, am particularly interested in, I think is very funny, and, and now that I've told you about it, you're gonna see it everywhere, is this thing called gamer bait. Um, this is a term that was coined by Sean Monahan, a cultural critic, um, formerly of a collective named K-Hole, a trend forecasting uh, collective that worked for different brands. And uh, he did a great piece where he identified this thing that I'd been seeing too, right? It's a the use of gamer aesthetics to market to gamers. So Ikea has now a gaming furniture lineup where they say, you know, they have all this copy written, things like make yourself comfortable in this world and the next one and the next one. And then also even uh, high fashion houses like Balenciaga produced a fashion show in the form of a digital game. The gamer is perhaps the newest type of subject that we have in uh, our capitalist society. The gamer being somebody that, like the lo-fi hip-hop girl, sits in their room at a desk, laptop open, relaxed, chill, and just watches the world pass by. So that's to say that on a concluding note, we are all gamers now. So this is a little review slide just to go over a little bit of what we covered that you might see come up in the journal entries or discussion. Today, uh, we talked about what culture is and how it's different from society. We defined a little bit better what cultural history is, I think through tools such as etymology, so understanding the meaning of a word like stereotype can help you sort of understand how mass media works to create identities and kind of how individuals exist within this spread of culture and society. Um, we also talked a little bit about the origins of that term stereotype. So that's that technique of etymology or looking up the origins of a word. Um, and then perhaps uh, my favorite part of the lecture, we talked about how the stereotypes around the gamer identity have changed leading up to 2023. Um, and that's all I've got for you today. There's gonna to be one more video that discusses your first assignment, and so look out for that one in the next module. All right, take care, bye-bye.